Florida scientists hope that these fluffy decoys can help with a very real problem. Yeah, Burmese pythons have devastated native wildlife in the Everglades. To fight the python plague, Florida approved a project that sounds like science fiction. Hunter bot rabbits. Hundreds of them, each mimicking the heat and scent of live prey, were deployed to end the invasion. Florida's Everglades to hunt Burmese pythons. All right, take a look at this right here. Scientists have deployed 120 robot rabbits. The goal was simple, lure the snakes and end the problem. What many overlooked is that in the Everglades, everything is hungry. The experiment didn't just fail, it backfired spectacularly. The story of the robotic rabbits isn't one of high-tech triumph. It's a story of pure, expensive chaos. A high-tech hunt goes haywire. At sunrise, a fleet of airboats cut through the mist of the Florida Everglades. On board were not hunters, but engineers and biologists. They were deploying a secret weapon, one they believed would finally turn the tide in a war they had been losing for decades. They called it Operation Mechanical Prey. The prey looked like simple marsh rabbits, but they were anything but. Each one was a sophisticated $4,000 decoy. This was the wow factor. These were not toys. They were hunter bots. Inside each furry, weatherproof shell was a high-tech marvel. A small, silent motor made the robot breathe with subtle twitches. An internal heating element kept its body at a perfect 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, mimicking a live mammal and a special cartridge slowly released the synthetic musky scent of a rabbit. They were in every way the perfect bait. The plan was brilliant, to put it mildly. 100 of these robots were placed in known Python hotspots. They were anchored to the ground inside protective pens and each was monitored by a motion activated camera. The idea was that a Python sensing the heat and the smell would approach. It would strike and wrap around the decoy. When the robot's sensors detected the pressure, it would send a silent GPS alert to a 24-hour response team. The hunters wouldn't have to find the snakes, the snakes would find them. Millions of dollars were poured into the project. The teams went live and everyone held their breath. Then the alerts started flooding in. At first, there was celebration. The system was working. The GPS pings were lighting up the map. But then the video footage started to download and the celebration stopped. The thing nobody tells you is what else is hungry in the Everglades. The first videos were not of pythons, they were of alligators. A 10-foot gator drawn by the scent and the heat was seen nudging the decoy. Then with terrifying speed, it clamped down. The gator ripped the $4,000 robot right out of its pen and dragged it underwater. The GPS signal went dark. This wasn't a one-time thing, it was a pattern. The alligators, the other apex predator in the swamp, were fascinated. They were smart. They quickly learned that these strange new rabbits were warm and easy to catch. They began actively hunting the decoys. The chaos escalated. Footage showed massive gators performing death rolls, tearing the expensive machines into shredded plastic and fake fur. And it wasn't just the gators. The robots were too convincing. Large birds of prey, like ospreys and bald eagles, were seen swooping down. They would try to snatch the rabbits, only to find they were too heavy, dropping them from a hundred feet in the air. Curious raccoons and bobcats, sensing no real danger, began dismantling the bots, tearing at the wiring. Within two weeks, over 80% of the robot army was gone, destroyed, submerged, or carried off by other wildlife. And the pythons? They barely got a chance. The few that did approach were scared off by the real predators fighting over the decoys. The project was a humiliating multi-million dollar disaster. This expensive failure was born from pure desperation. But what could make Florida so desperate to try this? A land eaten alive. To understand the robot rabbits, you have to understand the monster they were built to hunt. The Burmese python is not native to Florida. It's an invader from Southeast Asia, and it has turned the Everglades into an all-you-can-eat buffet. The story begins in the 1980s and 90s. Many people are crazy about exotic pets. They bought cute $5 baby pythons from pet stores, but those cute babies don't stay small. Within a few years, they become 10-foot, 12-foot, even 15-foot long predators. A snake that big isn't a pet, it's a liability. So what did people do? They drove to the edge of the wetlands and just let them go. 
This was bad, but what happened next was the real catastrophe. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew blasted South Florida. The Category 5 storm tore buildings apart. This included dozens of reptile breeding facilities and wildlife importers. The storm blasted open these buildings, releasing thousands of pythons at once. It was the perfect storm, in the worst possible way. The Everglades, it turns out, is a paradise for a python. It's warm, it's wet, and it's filled with millions of animals that have never evolved to defend themselves against a giant constrictor. The snakes had no predators. They were invisible. Their camouflage is so perfect you can be five feet away from a 10-foot snake and never see it. The numbers are mind-blowing. A single female python can lay a clutch of up to 100 eggs. The population isn't in the thousands. It's estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands, maybe more, and they are eating the Everglades clean. This is the real wow factor. Scientists at the Everglades National Park did a study. In the areas where pythons have taken over, the raccoon population has dropped by 99.3%. Opossums are down 98.9%. Bobcats, down 87.5%. And the marsh rabbits, the animal the robots were based on, they are gone. They have completely vanished from most of the park. These snakes don't just eat small stuff. They've been found with full-grown deer inside their stomachs. They even fight alligators. There are famous photos of a python that burst open after trying to eat a six-foot alligator. They are so dominant, they are erasing the native wildlife and destroying the food web from the bottom up. The state had to do something. Their first idea wasn't robots. It was a statewide call to arms. Hunters, bounties, and the Judas snake. When the scale of the invasion became public, Florida's first response was to turn it into a competition. In 2013, they launched the first Python Challenge. It was a massive media circus. They invited 1,600 people from across the country to come to Florida, get some basic training, and head into the swamp to hunt. TV crews followed them. People showed up with airboats, machetes, and a lot of confidence. The reality check was harsh. After an entire month of hunting, with over a thousand people scouring the wetlands, how many pythons did they catch? 68, not 68,000, 68. It was a total failure. To put it mildly, it proved that amateurs and even most pros simply cannot find these snakes. They are ghosts. So the state got serious. They realized a media stunt wasn't working. They launched the Python Elimination Program. This wasn't a contest. This was a job. They hired professional, licensed contractors to hunt 24 hours a day. They paid an hourly wage plus bonuses. $50 for the first four feet of a snake and $25 for every foot after that. A single large python could be worth hundreds of dollars. These hunters are some of the toughest people on earth. They drive for miles and miles all night long, scanning the banks of levees and canals with high-powered spotlights and they have removed thousands of snakes. As of today, the paid hunters have removed over 10,000 pythons, but the thing nobody tells you is that it's still not enough. The math just doesn't work. For every one snake a hunter finds, hundreds more are born, hidden deep in the swamp. The state was spending millions of dollars every year just to slow the problem, not solve it. They had to get cleverer. This led to one of the wildest wow factor ideas yet, the Judas snake. This was high-tech tracking. Scientists would capture a large male python. They would surgically implant a radio transmitter inside its body. Then they would release it back into the wild right during breeding season. The Judas snake, driven by instinct, would do what it does best, find a female. The scientists would follow the radio signal and the male would lead them right to a massive egg-laying female python. It was brilliant and it worked. They found several nests this way. But there was a problem. The Everglades is 1.5 million acres. That's a territory the size of the entire state of Delaware. A few Judas snakes couldn't possibly cover that much ground. It was too big, too dense, and too wet. The human hunters failed. The high-tech trackers failed. They needed a new weapon. They needed a lure. Why the swamp always wins. Here is where the entire chaotic and almost unbelievable story of the Python invasion comes full circle. We've talked about the failures. We've talked about the hunters trudging through the muck, finding nothing. We've talked about the Judas snakes, 
the radio tag traders who are supposed to lead researchers to hidden breeding grounds only to get eaten by alligators. Every human effort had failed. This string of crushing defeats led scientists to a dark but chillingly logical question. What if we stop looking for the snakes and make them come to us? This was a total paradigm shift. They were moving from offense to defense, from hunting to trapping. And their first idea was as brilliant as it was controversial. Before they ever built a single robot, they tried the real thing. This is a little known and highly controversial chapter in the War on Pythons. Researchers, backed into a corner and desperate for a win, set up special traps. The lure wasn't a scent. It wasn't a sound. It was live marsh rabbits. To be clear, this wasn't some blood sport. The rabbits were placed in heavily protected cages. The pythons couldn't actually harm them. But that almost made it worse. The rabbits were terrified. They were living, breathing, trembling bait. Their scent, the heat from their bodies, and the sheer panic they were emitting acted as an irresistible signal. That combination of life and terror radiated out into the swamp, and it drew pythons in from all over. The results were staggering. It was incredibly, undeniably effective. For the first time, the scientists had a method that worked, a way to pull these ghost-like predators out of the shadows. But the public backlash was massive, and it was immediate. When the story broke, animal rights groups were horrified. The media narrative was brutal. The idea of using terrified live animals as psychological bait, even if they were physically safe, was labeled as unacceptably cruel. It was seen as using one animal's suffering to solve a human-created problem. The optics were a nightmare. The project was condemned, defunded, and shut down almost overnight. But the data, the data was priceless. The scientists were left in a terrible position. They had the key, but the public had just padlocked the door. They now knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that a rabbit lure was the answer. They just couldn't use a real rabbit. This is when they asked the million-dollar question, can we build a rabbit? This was the birth of the Robotic Rabbit Project. This is where all that money, all those grants, and all that tech industry optimism was spent. They weren't just building a simple decoy. They thought they were building an ethical solution. They saw this as their comeback a way to use technology to bypass the moral nightmare and finally win the war. They became obsessed. They were so focused on perfectly replacing the rabbit that they forgot about everything else. Teams of engineers and biologists worked to get the thermal signature just right, to mimic the body heat of a small mammal. They developed chemical scent dispensers. They programmed motors to make the robot twitch and shudder, just like a terrified living creature. They built the perfect prey. Now let's go back to the chaos from the first section. The alligators, the ospreys, the bobcats. The scientists in their clean, high-tech labs had designed the perfect victim. It was warm, it twitched, it smelled like food, and most importantly, it never ran away. They deployed their expensive creations out into the swamp, picturing pythons slowly, silently zeroing in. What happened instead was a feeding frenzy. They didn't just build a python lure, they built an alligator lure, they built a bobcat lure, they built a hawk lure. They basically rang a giant $4,000 battery-operated dinner bell in the middle of the swamp, and every predator showed up except the one they wanted. Ospreys and hawks were the first to arrive, diving from the sky, ripping at the synthetic fur and trying to carry off a rabbit that was bolted to the ground. Then came the bobcats, stalking from the bushes, pouncing on the robots and batting them around in confusion. And finally, the alligators, the true kings of the swamp. They didn't stalk. They just arrived. These ancient predators lunged from the water, crushing the expensive high-tech robots in their jaws and dragging them into the depths. And the pythons? They were nowhere to be seen. Why? Maybe the pythons, as ambush predators, are more cautious. Maybe they were waiting for all the chaos to die down. Or maybe by the time they even caught the scent, an alligator had already destroyed the lure. So, was this high-tech failure a waste of money or a lesson we had to learn? Let us know below. Make sure to like and subscribe for more stories you won't find anywhere else.